Well, I don't know if it's dawned on you yet, but this is the last Sunday in January. And uh, so that means your fasting in January is near an end. And I know you're sad about that. You know, Sue and I, uh, Sue and I have uh, been doing our best to follow the instructions. And we've been doing some, in January, we had some pretty specific instructions. And we've been following that and doing some form of fasting every day. And he, now, you remember when Dave would teach about the early days and he did his first longer fast and, and then he was going to do his second longer fast. Do you remember what he, and he said, told Rosalie, he says, now I'm going to, I think I'm called to do a, my second longer fast. Do you remember what Rosalie said to him? She said, uh, really? You're going to do another one of those? Uh, would it be okay if you fasted somewhere else? <laughs> now, even in that, what does that tell you? Even in our beloved Dave who you poke him anywhere, only love comes out. But see, fasting is one of those tools that brings the, the dross. <laughs> you know, even in gold, you've got to purify that gold, you know. So you've got you to put fire on it, and that dross, you get it melty, and then the dross comes to the surface. Well, that same thing happens with fasting. <laughs> so Sue and I'm not going to tell much, baby, but Sue and I, were, we've been fasting all month, and, and nothing horrible, but... There was this one particular night, and we were trying to, you know, it was the electronics week. Remember that? We're not only fasting food, now that we're going to, now you don't, you don't fast electronics, but we're going to lay aside a weight, let's say it that way. So that week, there's no, no TV. Now, we don't do, Sue and I don't do Facebook and other stuff anyway, but we have to, we, have, we like monk. Okay, you know, clean stuff. So anyway, we're about halfway through the week, and we're doing pretty good, you know. And uh, I'll just say in Gary... Let's say some, uh, some dross, maybe, maybe, a little. <laughs> Sue says, too many strongholds at one time. We're watching Monk. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> it's like, I'm with you, baby. So, uh, but you, right next day, you're right back to it, right? Okay, all right. You give in, in but you know, anyway. So... Now, if that's not happening at your house, I wonder if you're doing it right. See? And I was going to say, you can be sad that, oh, man, this is, and it's, I, I was going to fast some. I was going to do some of that in January. And, and now the sun, this is the last Sunday. I have good news for you. It lasts the whole quarter. You got February. You got March. Glory to God. Start now. Hallelujah. And I, I take a little ribbing for this, and that's okay. It's good natured, I think. But, you know, because, listen, if you've never fasted at all, fasting is not, your flesh does not like that. I don't care if you've been a Christian a long time. You can lead a pretty holy life, you know, a good life, and, and still not deal with certain areas of the flesh. And, but fasting, my flesh still doesn't like it. Now, I'm, I'm getting where it's better, but it's still my flesh. You've got to be kidding. It doesn't like it. So we're trying to make, you know, just do something that is hard on the flesh. If you've never fasted at all, well, just, hey, <laughs> I was saying, well, just do a 12-hour. You know, if you ate a snack at 10 o'clock at night, right before bed, well, go 12 hours at least. Don't get up and have a big breakfast. Wait at least till 10 o'clock in the morning. You know, it's a 12-hour fast. So you might find even your flesh doesn't like that. First time I told my flesh it couldn't have eggs for breakfast, it wouldn't. I'll kill you. <laughs> What do you mean? <laughs> it didn't even like that. And then you can go till, uh, you know, like an 18-hour fast or 16. You can go till noon. Uh, during part of the month, we, we did just noon till 8. Nothing before noon and nothing after 8. My, my flesh didn't even like that. But then you can do one-day fast, two-day fast, three-day fast. And build up to it. So the good nature, they were kidding me, you know, after, I think, calling in the lost. And they were going, okay, I'm about to go home and do my eight-hour fast. They're going to sleep, you know. <laughs> and that's okay, but you've got to start somewhere. And the point of it is, start doing something to dominate that flesh. And you'll find out it doesn't take a whole lot. Your, your flesh will not like it. Then if you're doing it correctly, certain things are going to start coming to the surface. And the idea is you've got to deal with it. You know, deal with it. And sometimes that's hard. So I thank God for Pastor David. Well, I'm, he's right here. I've got to tell one story. I'm not going to tell how long. I know how long. But 
He, he did one really longer fast. Now, Dave used to do it. So we'd, he's talked about 40-day fast. So when he talks about a longer fast, it's longer than that. That's all I'm saying. He talks about he was, you know, Rosalie was wanting him to sign the papers to the house over. It was getting scary. He was getting so skinny. He said, when I, when I would take a shower, that strainer at the bottom of the shower, you know, that little thing that covers the drain, he said, that was a safety precaution. <laughs> I'd be in the shower. I'd have to run around to hit the, so the drops could hit me. You know, so. And I haven't seen anybody wasting away to that degree yet. But thank God we have a pastor that doesn't just preach it. We have a pastor who does what he says and not just says. Amen. I well, thank God for that. So be encouraged and don't quit. And just because it's a... And if you haven't started, start. You got February... Listen to the Holy Ghost. He's really smart. He's really smart. He knows, you, he knows your body better than you do. You listen to him. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, fortunately for you, we're not teaching on fasting today. I will say the last two messages Odie had me do, boy, there's some good stuff in there. I got to tell you, it's good. So, Alan's message this morning, I don't know what title they will put on it, but it's just the perfect introduction to what he's going to have me start today. Um, if I was going to put a title on Alan's message, it might be something like, have a healthy fear of God, but not a phobia fear. Is that okay? Something like that? Because there is an unhealthy fear of God, and there's a healthy fear of God, you know. And uh, <clears throat> the reason, you're going to see why that's so important, because... After all these years, he's finally going to let me start teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I've taught little parts of it over the years. There are certain parts that I, I had a good grasp of. But there are certain parts of it I would just have to just pray in tongues and keep going because I just, you know, don't know what it means. Not in the context, you know. So when you're like that, you don't preach it, you know. You, you keep meditating. And again, I want to give kudos to Pastor Dave who taught us Real revelation knowledge is line upon line and precept upon precept. And I like the way he would say, you know, you'll pray and you'll get a little understanding of something. And that it's like building a wall. And really it's like building a stone wall, not a brick wall. In a brick wall, every brick is the same size. But I have learned over these years when you pray, sometimes you get a revelation that's just kind of small. You, know, it's not a, not, you wouldn't say a biggie, but it's something that's crucial. But what you don't know is that that stone has to be in your wall. In order to support the big stone that's coming. See? And it's been like that. The big stone now is really the Sermon on the Mount. And later on we'll introduce the Sermon on the Plain. Did you know there's a Sermon on the Plain? Okay, we'll talk about that later. Okay. And, um, okay. All right. Sorry, incoming. <laughs> hmm. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. So let me tell you how, what he wants me to do. I printed this, not thinking I was going to use it, but I, I felt like he was saying to print it. I'm not going to say who this is. How much, how much, Lord? You know, in Jude, we're warned about false prophets that had entered into the church unawares. Well, many, when they come in unawares, that means you can't tell that they're false prophets. It means they look right and smell right, and they're still using the name of Jesus, and they, they talk like they're children of God, but they're false prophets. In fact, the ones Jude were talking about weren't even saved anymore. He said they were twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Still, they were preaching. And uh, the church was, it was such danger, the church was following them. To the point, Jude had to write that letter to straighten things out. And he gave a big warning, and he says, now you, you, you need to build your... Church, you keep building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Doing what? Praying in the Holy Ghost. You've got to keep yourselves in the love of God, see? And so thank God for Dave teaching us about praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Holy Ghost. Because I'm, I'm going to read you two quotes concerning the Sermon on the Mount by two major false prophets in the church today. And I'm not going to tell you who they are. Um, I'm just reading from their own websites. It's not some, I just copy and paste. I didn't change, I didn't alter, just copy and paste. And both of these men have uh, mega churches, over 40,000 members. And they're false prophets. 
they're absolutely the Jude. I'm not saying they're, maybe there's still life in them, I don't know. But they are exactly the kind that are saying no to the Lord. They're denying the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And you'll see what I mean. Now, before I even read this, these two quotes, turn to Matthew 28, which is not the Sermon on the Mount. But this is a good introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. And this is, uh, this is after Jesus is raised from the dead. In fact, he's been already appeared to the many people after his resurrection. Uh, he taught for 40 days, wasn't it? And uh, this, he's about to ascend. This is the last words that he says to the 11 right before he ascends into heaven. And let's see what his commission to the 11 are. So we'll pick it up in Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, <clears throat> All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now notice this. Go you therefore, now notice, teach all nations. Now, it's important that I point this out to you. Not just the Jews. You see that? When he says teach all nations, that is specifically talking about go teach the Gentiles. You understand that? That's important for a couple of these quotes that are coming up. So the commission is, I mean, it's fine to teach the Jews, but I'm sending you beyond the Jews now. You preach this same gospel to all nations. Now notice, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now notice, what, what are we supposed to tell them? Teaching them to observe. That word just simply means do. Yes. Teach them to do all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now the 11, you do know, all the 11 are Jews. So he's saying, everything I taught you Jews, you go teach the Gentiles. Can you see that? I'm not, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Teaching them to observe them, them who? All these nations. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So later on we learn, we see in the book of Acts, that the people, once they were born again, Jew or Gentile, they sat under the apostles' doctrine. You remember that? Breaking bread, house to house, day by day. They were learning the apostles' doctrine. And now we know what the apostles' doctrine was. What was the apostles' doctrine? They're teaching everything that Jesus taught them. Sermon you on the Mount. That? Would you say that's something? Okay, go ahead and look at Matthew 5. So you can see the red letters. If you have a red letter Bible. Matthew 5. I'm starting in verse 3. Now if you have a red letter Bible or phone... <laughs> Bible on your phone. I want you to look at the red letters. Starting in Matthew 5. Red letters, chapter 6. Red letters, chapter 7. Red letters. Would you say this is what Jesus taught? Okay. Sermon on the Mount is part of what Jesus taught. Are we in agreement? So would the assignment be you go and teach the Gentiles what I taught you on the Mount? <laughs> Fair enough. <clears throat> False prophet number one, who's on every religious channel in Tulsa several times a day. Doesn't live in Tulsa, but his program is on several times a day. Probably the godfather of the radical grace movement. This is a direct quote from his website. He says, whether interpreting the Old Testament or the words which Jesus spoke in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, let Jesus and his finished work at the cross be the key to unlocking all the precious gems hidden in God's word. Doesn't that sound eloquent? This means that we have to read everything in the context of what he came to do and what he accomplished at the cross for us. Now listen carefully. For example, some things that Jesus said in the four gospels were spoken before the cross. Duh. 
Sorry, I mean like 95% of what Jesus spoke was before the cross. Isn't that right? I mean, it's very little after. And some were said after the cross. Duh, number two. Okay. When he had already won our complete forgiveness and rightfully given us his righteousness. Now notice, it is the latter that applies to us today. Plain English. You don't have to listen to the Sermon on the Mount. You, in fact, he, from what he said right there, he's saying you don't have to pay attention to what he said before the resurrection. Well, that's going to wipe out about 95% of the red words in your Bible. False prophet number two, he specifically, specifically mentions the Sermon on the Mount. This guy also has got a church of about 40,000 people. <clears throat> So he asked the question concerning Matthew 5, verses 1 through 7, 29. Is the Sermon on the Mount, is this sermon intended for the church? He says, absolutely not. Heresy, heresy. These, you, you, many of you are watching these guys on your TV right now. Stop it. Mark them. Absolutely not. This guy says, I'm still quoting, it's intended for the self-righteous. It's a pre-salvation preach. He didn't even call it a teaching. It's a pre-salvation preach that exposes self-righteous pride and performance and, reve and reveals the need for God's righteousness as a gift through faith in order to see the kingdom and become children of God. Unless you really understand grace, don't go near the Beatitudes. Copy and paste. Okay? They will mess you up. Teaching the Beatitudes to Christians produces legalism and religious pride or condemnation in them. We must rightly divide the Word of God. To see what Jesus was saying and trying to achieve here. He wasn't preaching to the church. He wasn't preaching to born again believers. Now remember what Jesus said. He was preaching to the Jews. Where the climate of the day was a striving for righteousness through works. The church does not need the sermon on the mount. If you were to ask Jesus if he intended that sermon to be a standard that the church measures itself against, he would either start rolling around on the floor screaming with laughter or bow his head and weep. Now say with me, I'm glad I go to this church. I'm glad for the Holy Spirit who has given me an inoculation Concerning those that would deceive me. I have an inoculation. Against deception. And I will believe no lies. I mean you're thankful for Pastor Dave. Teaching us. Like just laying down his life. Over and over. To teach us. Teach us. Pray in the Holy Ghost. No wonder Jude ends up. You better. You better. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Hmm. Now that's, and I'm telling you, people are believing this by the millions. The millions around the world. Their churches are, are, are 40,000, but they have millions of followers on TV. And I, we, Sue and I personally know some of these that have got, they started there. You know where it winds up? It always winds up in the same place. The end result is universalism. Where everybody's saved, you don't have to repent. Everybody's saved, even the devil. And that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Now see, I have to give that introduction to make, it, make you understand where we're going. Because we're go today we're going to do the Sermon on the Mount introduction. And I don't know if we'll even get through with introducing the introduction. <laughs> hmm. 
the way he gave this to me to start, you can go ahead and turn back. Yeah, we're in Matthew 5. We'll start there in a moment. I can put a marker there because we're going to go somewhere else first, which is, you can go ahead and be turning to Exodus 19, which is the chapter right before the Ten Commandments, by the way. Exodus 19. See, <clears throat> if we're going to really understand this and walk in this, this is so beautiful. God gave the law on a mountain called Mount Sinai. Remember that? Here, God is speaking through his son to the people on another mountain. I want you to, we're going to draw a contrast between these two mountains, okay? I'm going to have to stay pretty close to my notes, and Sue knows I've been reading and praying and reading and praying and writing for a long time on this. I've only been trying to teach this for about 20 years. Really, I've, I, I, you don't know how many times I've started this, and, and the Holy Ghost just wouldn't let me do it, because I didn't have enough pieces. To be honest with you, he would, I wouldn't be teaching it now if I hadn't been through First John. If I hadn't been through these two fasting lessons that I just did, and I hadn't been through God at war. It took all of those to finally, there's a few key points in here I never could get, but I got them now. And once you get it, I'm telling you, the revelation of God is like a running stream. You don't have to pi pigeonhole little verses and try and you know, hit square pegs into round holes. When it's really God, it runs like a running stream from Genesis to maps. You'll, find, you'll see it everywhere. So let me just uh, <clears throat> say, you know, in the beginning, when God first had his people delivered out of, Israel, out of Egypt, God met with Moses alone on Mount Sinai. Remember that? The people were not permitted to go up the mountain with Moses. They were not even allowed to touch the mountain, lest they die. All right? So let's, let's look at that. Exodus 19, and uh, if we really had all kinds of time, we'd just read the whole chapter, but... Let's start in verse 16. See, it's on these two mountains is the two covenants. And God's dealing with completely different people. Yes, sir. Okay. He says, I've got to stay with the notes. Okay? I just work here. So Exodus 19, let's pick it up in verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain. This is Mount Sinai. And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Why are they trembling? Fear. Hey, this is real fear. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part, that means the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai, now get this picture of this mountain, because we're going to look at the other mountain in a minute. Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. You're a little follower. Moses says, come on, come on with me. We're going to go meet with God. <laughs> Fire and smoke and shaking. You're going to go up there? <laughs> what? <clears throat> Verse 19. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, now get this, and waxed louder and louder, can you imagine what this, I mean, this sound of a trumpet, it's ear piercing and it's just doing nothing but getting louder and louder. Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai. God. Now say with me, God on the mountain. God came down on that mountain. That's what it says. God, the Lord, came down upon Mount Sinai. The Lord, God, on the mountain, on the top of the mount. And the Lord called up Moses to the top of the mountain. Moses went up. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people. Now, no, that means instruct them. Lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, to look, and many of them perish. Now, come on down. Then the Lord, it, Moses goes down. He gives them that instruction. They're okay with that, by the way. <laughs> Moses goes back up, and then what happens? The Lord gives him the Ten Commandments, and then he comes back down. Now look at verse 2. Let's jump on over to chapter 20, verse 18. It's right after the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and all the people saw the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountains smoke it, smoking. And when the people saw it, <laughs> Did they run toward it? They booked it away from it. <laughs> they removed and stood afar off. Scared the bejabbers out of them. This is a phobia fear here, right? This is a real fear. And they said unto Moses, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Tell you what. You speak with us, and we will hear. Don't let God speak to us. <laughs> Lest we die. Now, listen, listen. That is the flesh speaking. That is the flesh speaking. That's why it doesn't want you to pray. It doesn't want you to fast. It's afraid you're going to hear God. And when you hear God, it will die. You will mortify. You will put to death. And your flesh will run like they did. It will run like a scalded dog. It will it'll do a lot of things. It will go to church. It will give its money. It will join committees. It will watch the nursery. It will paint the church. It will mow the grass. It will do all kinds of things. But let's not talk about prayer, fasting, worship, and the word. All right. So they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, He said unto them, Fear not, for God is come to prove you. Now notice, he, God did this on purpose, knowing they are flesh creatures. These are, these are not born again people. These are flesh creatures. So God has come to prove you. Why? Why did he come like he did? That his fear may be before your faces. That you sin not. And the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness. Notice where God was. On this first mountain... There, let me just, yes sir, I heard it again. Stay with the notes. <laughs> let me read. What a contrast between God speaking from Mount Sinai to the people through Moses and the gentle Savior, Jesus, speaking to the people while seated on the mountain in Israel. What a contrast. It is the same God speaking in both cases. On Mount Sinai, it was God speaking forth the law to a spiritually dead people. But on this mountain where Jesus is, it is God speaking prophetically to his own children, born of his own spirit. Now, you, bear with me. I know they're not born again yet in Matthew 5. Bear with me. But on this mountain, it is God speaking prophetically to his own, prophetically to his own children, Born of his own spirit. It is God. The Sermon on the Mount. If you'll allow me. It's God speaking to us. By his son. And you can turn there. Just write it down for later. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says. God. Who at sundry times. And in divers manners. Spake in time past. Unto the fathers by the prophets. Moses is also called a prophet. I don't know if you know that. But God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath 
in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds see there's a whole different kind of fear that'll come upon you when you get in the presence of Jesus it's not a phobia of fear see your spirit man runs to him as your soul is renewed, your soul runs to him. There's only one part of you that's still afraid. And it has good reason. And that's the flesh. Because as you hear from Jesus and conform to his will, just like then, the flesh will die. Because you'll mortify it. The Sermon on the Mount is God speaking with all men through Jesus Christ. Each man, I just picture that Sermon on the Mount. I've got some historical things. This mountain is not... Most of the paintings I've ever seen show a nice gentle slope going up with a lot of grass and everything, you know. And uh, hi history, people that really know where it was, it's near Capernaum. It's not that kind. It's, it's, uh, it's not a real pleasant, gentle slope. It's fairly steep. And there's two little flat places as you go up it. They think Jesus spoke from the first flat place. Which you can imagine, you're going to see in a minute, there's many, many people here. This is not the 12. This is lots and lots and lots of folks. So the elevation probably helped. Okay? But how many of you know you don't really need amplification if you've got the Holy Spirit? Now, see, I have an Angie, so I have an amplifier. But anyway, <laughs> that's another thing. <laughs> All right. All right, you've got to see this one in your Bible to understand this. Go to, I know you've heard it before. Look at Luke 16, 16. And if you underline, you've got to underline this verse, put little stars in the margin, little eyeballs, right? Look, <laughs> you've got to understand this. People not understanding this is why they tend to fall for the teachings of those two false prophets I quoted a while ago. Luke 16, 16 says this. The law and the prophets were until John. John who? John the Baptist. And specifically, he is talking about the day that John baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. The reason that there's a change right there, quickly, because I see people here that I, I don't know for sure if you've heard it before, so I'm going to capsulize it again why is that baptism so important by the way if you read it carefully you'll see Jesus he waited till everybody else was baptized first before he came to be baptized in other words he wasn't doing his baptism as an example for the others even John the Baptist did not know at that moment why Jesus wanted to be baptized by him John said no I need to be baptized by you <laughs> and, but Jesus knew there was a real reason and here's the reason. We know that Jesus would not go to the cross physically for about another three years. But on this day, when John lays him down in the water, that's a, baptism is a type of death. It is like, it's a type in a shadow. That the water represents the grave. I'm dying to my old life. Well, that's why the other people came. They were baptized under repentance. But Jesus does not need to be baptized to repentance. Jesus, that's why he waited till the end. He's, his is different. He's making a visual vow to the Father. He's going, Father, I know why you sent me. I know I'm here to die. Father, when John lays me down under the water, that is my vow to you. I'm going all the way to the cross. But Lord, when John raises me up, that's also a demonstration of my faith that I am trusting that promise you made to me in the Old Testament. You will not leave my soul in hell. Neither shall my flesh see corruption. I'm trusting you, Father, to raise me from the dead. See, and God looks on the heart in the same way he looked on Abraham's heart in the Old Testament when Abraham raised the knife and he was going to plunge it into his son Isaac. And he didn't have to do it because God looked on the heart and saw it was done. He counted it as finished. And so he provided a ram instead. You remember that whole thing? Well, same way God's looking on the heart of Jesus. And he can tell this is done. And it's like a gavel came down in the courtroom of heaven. Because see, Jesus didn't die for his sins. He died in the place of Adam. 
And I mean the whole species of Adam. So when Jesus died, it's like Adam legally is dead. And when he did this baptism, God accepted it as a finished fact. And it's like a gavel came down in heaven. The first Adam is dead. But if the first Adam is dead, isn't God now free to assign a second Adam? The last Adam. That's why he declares, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And that's why you see it that day, the Holy Spirit coming on Jesus. What's he bring? What's the Holy Spirit? Why is he doing that? He is reestablishing the dominion that the first Adam lost. God, I can't hardly preach that still without a running fit. I got that in the trucks praying till my lips ran off in the, on the floor. I'm telling you, glory to God. There's even more to it than that. Do you know John is the last Old Testament prophet? Yeah. He's the last Old Testament prophet. If you want to, now they will teach this at another, another day. That's also the day that the, the last Old Testament prophet washed Jesus to become a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that's another lesson for another day. That's a good one. You'll like it. So now Luke 16, 16, said all that to say this. That's why he says the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, since the day that John baptized me, that was coronation day for Jesus as the last Adam. He has all dominion now. He's, he's been anointed with the Holy Ghost. He is the, the last Adam. He is, could I say, the God of this world. What God intended for the original Adam. Now, not a, not a big G God. Okay. Understand? In the same way. So now he says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. And every man presses into it. That lets us know for sure that Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God not the Old Covenant Mosaic Law. That tells you, if you understand that, these are false prophets. He was not just preaching law to the Jews. He wasn't preaching the law at all. Now he's going to mention the law. But look at it again in your Bible. Put eyeballs in the margin. Look, star it, do whatever it takes to get this indelibly written in your brain. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, which includes Matthew 5, <laughs> since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. So that phrase, the law and the prophets were until John. Now listen up. Nudge, if they're falling asleep, nudge them. They've got to hear this. The key to understanding the Sermon on the Mount is the knowledge that Jesus is speaking to you prophetically as a born-again child of God. It's prophetic. Now, see, see that unique period between the baptism of John and the resurrection. That is a, a unique period in history that will never come again. Physically, Israel is still under the law. But spiritually, the kingdom of God is in force at the same time. Very unique. Never happen again. Okay? But this is why Jesus could demonstrate the kingdom and say the kingdom of God is at hand, which means it's available. That's why he could do it, because he had already been anointed as Adam, Lord, King, already before he physically had to go to the cross and then be resurrected. He's functioning already that way, and he's teaching as though we are already born again. Even though those people were not, they could not be for about three more years. That, and he words things a little bit to help with that along the way. <laughs> but one more time, Luke 16, 16. Look at it again. You, if you don't have this, you're going to miss the whole thing. The law and the prophets were until John. Did Gary say that or did Jesus say that? Get over yourself. I'm just saying what he said. You wouldn't believe some of the comments. Since that time, since when? Since Jesus was anointed king. Since the baptism of John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. You got that? 
So the key to understanding the Sermon on the Mount is the knowledge that Jesus is speaking to us as born again children of God. It's prophetic really more to us than it was to them at that moment because they weren't literally born again yet. Now, it's as, it's as if this is a training lesson for newborn children of God, instructing them how to function while wearing sinful flesh and living in a fallen world. If you try to understand the Sermon on the Mount from the perspective of a lost sinner trying to measure up to some legalistic standard, you are doomed to failure. Because the Sermon on the Mount is for children of God only. I did not say church members. I didn't get enough amens. So that what I'm saying is I'm not saying because you belong to a church. I'm saying because you've been born of God's Spirit. You're going to, as we go through this, you're going to see it's a much higher standard than the Mosaic Law. Unregenerate people, with their best efforts, could not even keep the Mosaic Law. Much less are they going to be able to keep this higher standard than the Mosaic Law. It's impossible. The Bible is real clear. There is none righteous. No. Not one. That means not one human. That means not Moses, not Abraham, not David. For sure not David. <laughs> we love David, don't we love? But none of them, with their best effort, could even keep the Mosaic Law. Not one. Isn't that right? And he's going to raise the bar? Uh, we might need to do something different than what they did. Well, that's about what's to happen. Without Christ in you, that's why this, is, this message is to born-again people only. Really born-again people. Because without Christ in you, and let parentheses, the new nature, that new nature, without that being in you, there is zero possibility of you walking according to the instructions of the Sermon on the Mount. You can't even keep the Mosaic Law. You're sure not going to be able to keep this one. Oh, but if you've been born again. Hmm. I keep hearing, stay with the notes. <laughs> Alan, he's not going to let me run off and preach anyway. Christ made the new birth possible through extreme agony for the express purpose of empowering you with his own nature in order to set you free from sin so you could walk in the fullness of the instructions here given on the Sermon on the Mount. As you read the Sermon on the Mount, you must continually remember this. And I mean, you have to, for Gary, I have to keep bringing myself back to this fact. Otherwise, you're going to get, you're going to slip into old thinking of condemnation, I, I, I can't live up to this, I can't do this, this is not who I am. That's all a lie. That's looking at it from the perspective of a lost person trying to keep a standard. You'll never, you'll never succeed that way. No. You must continually remember, I am a child of God. I have the nature of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am not trying to become this I already am this. Now that's the key. This is the power of the gospel. I am a new creature. Recreated in the image of Christ. I am not who I used to be. I am a child of God. Empowered by God. To walk godly. Remember what the grace that teaches us something? Remember what it teaches us? The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and to walk soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This message is for that person. And that's who you are. Now, you may say, Gary, I need to have a private consultation with you because I read this. I know that you say that's who I are. I are not sure I are this. <laughs> but you really are. In your spirit, 
You are. And he's working that through your soul till it comes out your pores of your little hands. Because this is really who you are. But if you don't believe that, you'll never walk there. See? All right. So say it with me. I am a child of God. I am empowered by God to walk like Him. As He is, so am I in this world. Glory to God. See, the, the Sermon on the Mount is where you learn, one, one place where you learn to rely upon the mechanism of righteousness. Now, to some of you, that might be a new term. If we had time, we'd have Nathan come up right now and do Nathan 101 out of Romans 2, where it talks about when the Gentiles that have not the law, but they do by nature those things contained in the law. Well, they become a law unto themselves. See, and you can go to Hebrews where he says, I'm going to write my law now. For the born again person, I'm going to write my law in your heart and in your mind. You'll all know me from the least to the greatest. No one will have to teach you from right and wrong anymore. You're going to know it from the inside out. Well, that's that mechanism of righteousness. And if you're truly born again, you can hear your conscience. You can hear that voice. And you're about to, you're thinking of doing, just pick one, fornication. Well, immediately that voice on the inside is that you're a child of God. You don't do that. You're about to, uh, got a lot of kids in the room. You're about to go get drunk. And there's a voice. See, and the Holy Spirit bears witness with that voice every time. It says, the Holy Spirit bears witness. You're a child of God. Yeah. You're a child of God. The new nature on the inside. You're a child of God. You don't get drunk. That's a flesh thing. You're not led by the flesh anymore. See, that's that mechanism of righteousness. If you learn, I'm telling you, the more I'm in this, the more I just want to worship God just for that alone. I mean, it's the most precious thing. I don't ever, ever, ever want to violate the voice of my conscience. Not ever. I mean, it's the safe guide. And Jesus paid a terrible price for us to have it. It's how he walked that way. And thank God for the conscience. You know, if you start getting a little, you start deviating from the path a little, like, boy, that con it's like the bumper rails to keep you on the path of righteousness. Start deviating to the left, that conscience will scream bloody murder. Well, no. It'll scream, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Oh, okay. And you go off, you're about to go off to the right. Don't do that. Man, that's the, that's the mechanism of righteousness. And if you, if you don't have that inside of you, if you really don't know that fornication is wrong, you're not born again. You need to get, get saved today. Because you, 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 if you don't have that, yes, sir. now he says qualified a little, you might have it and have seared it so bad that in maybe one area you can't hear it. We have a solution for that. It's called 1 John 1, 9. If the word says it is sin, it is sin, whether you like that or whether you don't like it, and you need to go repent, the blood of Jesus will not, he'll not only forgive you, it says he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if you're serious about it, whew, that conscience will become tender again, and you'll be able to hear it again anyway. That's the mechanism of righteousness. It's really Christ in you. It is His nature empowering you to walk like Him in darkness, but still be light. It's a completely different walk than the old covenant, trying to keep the law by human willpower. Can't do it. This is a supernatural righteousness. It's the gift of God by grace alone. Boy, we could just verse after verse, the gift of righteousness. Those that receive the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace shall reign, rule and reign in life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Your flesh is not the boss of you anymore. You don't let it reign and rule over you anymore. No wonder it wants to run from prayer. No wonder it'll, it'll just offer you anything. Just please don't pray. Don't do that Jude 20 thing, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the whole. Don't do that. Why? If you do that, I'm going to die. And then I'm doing it. And I'm doing it a lot. And pushing away from the table. And meditating the word and worship. Flesh, you're going down. You've lost your dominion over me. And if it makes it rough on my wife, dealing with 
uh, dross that comes to the surface in the process, I got a good wife. She'll love me through it. Skim that off. Hope to God someday there's no more dross coming to the top. But anyway, <laughs> we're not there yet. Hallelujah. But it, it, anyway, this is a completely different walk than trying to keep the law by human willpower. That's old covenant. This is supernatural righteousness that you got free by grace the day you were born again. It's activated by faith. And what I mean by that, you have to believe it in order to ever walk in it. You will come to rely on the new nature more than you rely on your own mind or your own willpower. If he says, if that nature says no, I yield. See, that's a renewed mind. A renewed mind has knowledge, all right, but it's not the knowledge that causes it to be renewed. It's the knowledge and then the yielding to the Lord within. Yielding to that new nature, that's a renewed mind. That's when your actions change. So I, if I'd stay with the notes, I'd be better. So a renewed mind is one that constantly yields to the promptings of the new nature and the leadership and the leadership that comes by the Holy Spirit. So the Sermon on the Mount is Christ. Now, let's go one step further. See the Sermon on the Mount? You know he's still preaching it. But he's preaching it from the inside of you. It is Christ in you. Boy, you're going to see that so clear as we go through this. We are th I think we're going to make it through the introduction today. But the Sermon on the Mount is Christ speaking forth His nature from within you. This is His constant message. He's still preaching all of this through that new nature that's in you because it's Christ in you. He has made you a new creature. This is who you are. As, say it with me one more time, as He is, so am I in this world. Now, one more part of the introduction. When Cole was little, about my grandson Cole, when he was five or six, we were out in the ba his backyard one day, and we're sitting there, and I don't know exactly what we were doing, but he said, Papa, can you see the lion sitting there in that tree? Of course, I looked. There was no lion. I said, no. Cole, I don't, I don't see a lion. He says, Papa, can you pretend... <laughs> I see the lion now. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you today to pretend with me for a moment. This scenario will help all of us understand this better. In my little pretend scenario, every one of us got saved in heaven. We got picked up somehow. Beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> or, no, beam me up, Michael, Gabriel. And we all went to heaven. We heard the gospel. We got born again in heaven. But now Jesus says, we're all going, we're like Peter. It's good that we should be here. Where's my mansion? <laughs> we're just going to stay here. And he says, no, no, no. No, that's for another time. No, no. We got a lost world to save. I got you saved. But now we're going to go to work. Back on planet earth where the darkness is. So if you allow me in my pretend, he brought us down in a gospel spaceship Let us all get out, and we're all seated nice on, on the, on the right, right, right down at the foot of this mountain. And he walks up to that first level place, and he sits down, by the way. And he begins to teach us. And what he's doing is this. He's going, look, you are a new species that did not exist ever on planet Earth before. You are light. You are salt. You're going to see all of this in the sermon. You are the light of the earth. You are salt. But I need to instruct you how to walk as children of God in the darkness of this world. Because we're all here on assignment. We're here to bring forward the kingdom of God into this lost planet. And he begins to teach us. And every one of us is like, in our minds, we're, we're, we've all got problems. We're all broken. We've got all these different, we're still, he had to put us back in flesh bodies when we got here. You allow me? <laughs> Can you pretend? <laughs> yeah. 
And we're going, man, this thing's giving me trouble. I'll show you how to deal with it. I had to deal with it too. I know what you're going through. I'll show you how to deal with it. He says, I'll show you how that thing can never win again. And we hadn't even read the first verse of the Sermon on the Mount yet. You want to read the first verse for a close or not? Or you don't even know what you're asking. <laughs> you have no idea what that means to me. Okay, I think we'll be safe with this much. So let's just read Matthew 5, 1. Oh, I can't. Back up to verse 23 in chapter 4. Well, it's part of it. It's why the people were there. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and notice, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought, a, brought unto him a few sick people. No. They brought unto him all sick people. That were taken with divers diseases and torments. And those which were possessed with devils. And those which were lunatic. And those that had the palsy. My f favorite four words. And he healed them. Yeah, I was going to say, them who? If words mean anything. He healed them all. Well, because of that, now look, there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, that's the ten cities, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and even from beyond Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. That set means he sat down, which is a common way for rabbis to teach. But he sat down, and he opened his mouth. See in right there, Hebrews 11, 2. God, through divers manners, different ways, in times past, spoke unto us by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Glory to God. He opened his mouth. Now, the very first one, some of this I'm going to save for next week because I'm really running out of time. Let me do it like this. These pages are sticking together. The first thing he says, we're new, now get the picture. He brought us down from heaven. We're about to go into the darkness. He is training us how we're to function. And the first thing out of his mouth, the first thing that he says to us, blessed. How many want to be blessed? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for their, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you look it up over in Luke, when Luke gives the account of it, it just says, blessed are the poor. It doesn't even have the words in spirit. Do you understand how different that word is? The first thing he said to us as new creatures, how opposite that is to the world. See, happiness for the world, blessed, happy, fortunate. Look it up in the Amplified. Blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied. <laughs> well, the world says, well, if you're going to be blessed, happy, and fortunate, and envied, then what you need is wealth, fame, pleasure, See, the Apostle John, he warned us in his epistle. 1 John 2, 15. Don't, you don't need to turn there. We're out of time. We'll do it again later anyway. Love not the world. Gee, I wonder where he got that. Maybe he listened to Jesus. Because Jesus is the first thing out of his mouth. You're not going to be part of the world. We've come to save the world. Not be part of it. You're going to be in it. But you're on a mission from God. You keep that poorness in spirit. You'll see it here in a minute. Keep that humble attitude. Don't be like the world. All pride and how did John say it? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, here it is, the lust of the flesh. He's, Jesus is warning them, really. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. The world's passing away. He's, the world is going to pass away. And the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. All of that really is included right here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We are to be, a, now listen to this, listen to this. We are to be poor in spirit the same way a soldier in the army is poor in spirit. A good soldier has surrendered his will to his commanding officer. He is not trying to be the one in charge. Isn't that right? A good soldier receives his orders to charge the hill. He salutes smartly and charges the hill. Think about it. In combat, I think about my dad and all the other soldiers in Germany and Pacific, wherever they were in World War II. They don't own anything. Even their food, their clothing, their weapons, everything. It's supplied by the army or the Air Force, whatever branch they're in. It's not supplied by them, by them is it? They're, they're poor in spirit, totally reliant. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's in the sermon later. And all these things shall be added unto you, soldier. Humble in spirit. What does it mean, poor in spirit? Second Corinthians. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Second Corinthians 6.10. You don't have to turn there. Paul talking about himself. He had this attitude of heart like a soldier. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Now get this. As poor yet making many rich. Now get this. As having nothing and yet possessing all things. Think about it. On the battlefield... A soldier, he owns nothing. But backing him up are all the resources of the military to help him accomplish his assignment. Did you know that ground troops can call in an airstrike? Did you know Jesus said he could too? Well, he did. You can look it up later, Matthew 26, 53. He says, Think, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father? And he shall give me presently more than 12 legions of angels. He could have called in an airstrike. You can call in an airstrike. You got loved ones resisting. I recommend calling in an airstrike. Sometime we'll talk again how, how basically through obedience, Norval called in an airstrike on his daughter Zona when she was all messed up with drugs. One angel came, didn't say nothing. Norval says, when you're 12 foot tall and you just came from heaven, you don't have to say nothing. <laughs> All you got to do is show up. And he scared every dope devil out of my daughter. Zona never used drugs again, not ever. It's okay to call in an airstrike once in a while. But do you own angels? Do you own angels? No. No, you don't really own angels. Those soldiers don't own airplanes. But the military has them. And your father has angels. Probably everything else you might ever need, I think. You know? Already I'm seeing, can you see it ahead? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. You've got to have, be poor in spirit, though. To, same way a soldier is totally reliant on the military. We are totally reliant on the kingdom of God. But if we focus on that, there's nothing you're ever going to need you're not going to have. Either that or he's, he's got a really bad general. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Jesus is a good general. King, whatever. <laughs> All right. See, Jesus, he said, I, I could call it an airstrike basically to deliver him from having to go to the cross. But he didn't do it because self-preservation was not the goal. And it's not the goal for us either. The cross was the goal for him. And the mission came first. Even before the preservation of his own life. Jesus is saying here, just in this one sentence. For children of light, we are blessed. If we maintain the mindset that we are soldiers of the cross. 
receiving and acting on our orders from the Lord. All the resources of heaven are at our disposal. Ours is the kingdom of heaven. That's what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you become totally reliant on him, there is no resource you will ever need that you do not have. Stay here, feet. Mm. Ours is the kingdom of heaven as long as we remember who we are, where we are from, and why we are here. Church, resist pride at all costs. Remember, without him, we can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. Did you enjoy the introduction? Yeah. Hallelujah. That's one verse. We made it to one verse. We've got three chapters here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we can teach this. Thank you, Lord. We've grown up enough where we can receive this. Lord, I already feel the change working in me, and I know it's going to be working in all of us. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for everything you have done, are doing, and will do for us. Father, I thank you that you're growing us up to think really more with the mind of Christ. To think with eternity in mind. To get way past our little, what seems like problems and habits and patterns and Father that's not really even who we are no wonder our flesh wants to run from the mountain and Father we're not running from the mountain anymore we're running to the mountain we're going to sit and dine on the master's words and let your spirit do the digesting in us till we walk like him talk like him and have the same results he had Father you will have your revival in Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that, you can say, Amen, Amen. amen.